in the surface platform in the United States Navy, and so probably, arguably, the world. And we're going to get it there. It's just three years off. The surface war, we've already deployed the surface warfare package. We need, we're going to add a missile to it to improve its offensive potency. And the mine countermeasure package, mission package, is in, we'll start undergoing operational testing in the Gulf of Mexico this summer. Um, and it's going to work. The, we know that the sonar works. We know that the elements works. We know that the airborne mine neutralization system works. And it's just getting them all tested and going through that to prove it to the world. Um, so that's, that's littoral combat ship. Um, a couple other things that aren't talked much about littoral combat ship, I think that's a big advantage for us that this ship is going to bring to the fleet. So if we go to the program record, which is 52 ships, I'll do some math for you, hopefully not too bad. 52 ships, we have a 3-2-1 crewing concept, which you have three crews for two ships, for two hulls, and one of those hulls is always forward deployed. So you get, if you have 52 ships, 26 of them are always on deployment. If you wanted to have 26 DDGs always on deployment, you'd need 120 of them. We'd have to double the number of DD if, if you cone a space, crewed them, and didn't rotate them. So you get in manpower savings alone with 78 crews, and that's 50 people plus 20-man mission package crew, save almost a billion dollars a year over the same number of DDGs. They don't do the same missions. They weren't designed to do. They're not designed to do the same missions as a DDG. They're designed to do mine countermeasures. They're designed to do ASW in the littorals, and they're designed to do SUW in the littorals. But what we learned on this deployment, which we, we didn't really learn, we knew it, we proved it, this ship can do any of the phase zero or phase one tasks that a $2 billion DDG with 300 people on it can do, because it's got the same helicopter. And it's actually got better capability to do boardings, because that's what they're trained to do, the, the mission package on there, and they've got better ribs than the DDG. So it, it, we proved a lot of stuff that we knew about this ship on deployment. And I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty excited about it. And, and last year I probably wasn't as excited about it, but I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be what we need, and it's what, it's, it's the capability, you know, if I get four of these for the cost of one DDG. Can four of them do, no, they, they, don't, don't compare the missions and don't compare anything else. But this ship is, it's going to be able to do what we bought it to do, and it's going to be able to do a lot of other stuff that we knew it could do, but we didn't think about it at the time. So, next slide, please. Naval Surface Expeditionary Warfare Command. Um, it's funny, I sent a note to the CNO a couple of weeks ago, and this was one of the things in my uh, vision statement. And so he wrote me a note back, goes, hey, I'd like to, you know, where is that physically located? I'd like to go visit that command. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> so I wrote him back and said, well, it's, it exists only in a proceedings article <laughs> and in my brain. But we're going to get we're going to get it. We just we just briefed the two four stars last week. Had a had a had a personal meeting with them, the three type commanders and the two fleet four stars, and we're we're moving forward on this command. So what is it? The, what is about the command? Why is this important to me? Um, and it supports war fighting first. It's important to me to have to support the CNO's tenet of war fighting first. There is no command in the surface navy right now that who has a flag officer assigned to it who is tasked with looking at the development training and assessment of tactic techniques and procedures across all the missionaries in which we ask our ships to do every day simultaneously. We have an Air and Missile Defense Command down at Algren, and they do integrated air missile defense. We have a Naval Mine and uh, Anti-Submarine Warfare Command in San Diego, which looks at the undersea domain. We don't have a command that does SUW. We don't have a command that does EW for surface ships. None of these exist. So this is not going to be a giant command. It's not going to be hundreds and hundreds of people, but it's going to be some pretty, pretty dedicated, skilled individuals. And we're going to, there's going to be a lot of lieutenants and a lot of lieutenant commanders, weapons, tactic instructors. We stole that from the aviators. Um, we think it's a great program. Um, and so we have already started. We've, we've made the down payment. We've graduated three classes of anti-submarine warfare weapons, tactic instructors, and the second IAMD class or weapons tactic instructor has started up. Um, and the two warfare centers I just previously mentioned are the ones that execute those for us. So why are we doing this? We have to have, and it goes back to my first priority, it's the development of our force. We have to have a solid methodology from 02 to 06 to develop warfare skills for the people we ask to go out and fight those ships. We have some unbelievably good tacticians out there riding around our ships. We really do. But it's not by design. Some of it is by chance. It's by what ships they were assigned to and what that ship was doing when they were assigned to it 
and maybe with the XO and the CO of that ship's previous experiences were and how good they are at training. So that, that's that, and it's, it's a very important uh, concept for me to, to get back to my number one priority for the officers. So there you have it. I hope it's going to be standing up in the, in the summertime. Um, we'll see. But it's, it's, going to, it's going to stand up. I just don't know if it's going to stand up with a dozen people, what we exactly need. So anyways, next slide. So talked about kind of where we were, what are the issues, and, and so I'm going to camp out on this one for a pretty good long time. Um, not, I know we've got to do questions here in a little bit, and uh, I'm hard up against the the big boss of the Navy, so I'm not going to eat into his time. So what are we doing about some of the things that I was talking? I could go on for hours and hours on all the stuff that we're doing, but um, we're fighting with it. Just talk about the Naval Surface and Expeditionary Warfare Command. Um, I think that's going to be a good step for us to get standard tactic techniques and procedures out there uh, on all the ships, have the tactics that are up to date, we don't just leave it up to the captains of the ships to try and figure it out, looking at certain cybernet pages to see what the latest and greatest thing is out there. Um, simulation strategy. So I, I talked last year, and I think, uh, I'm not sure if we showed a film or not about some of the, so there, there's a couple of elements to this. There's tactical simulation, and then there's simulation that you can use that's very, very high fidelity to train watch standards. And we've, we've done that, we're doing it in the littoral combat ship program, and I think it's got wide application for the force. Um, uh, for the virtual reality training, think think along the lines of the you know the PS4, or the you know the Xbox 360 stuff, which my 20-year-old son spends like most of his time of his life doing. Um, it, it it's very you know imagine you know a guy sitting there with a and he's walking through the spaces and pipes start leaking and if he doesn't turn the right valve, the leak gets worse and then a chief avatar comes in and chews him out and all this kind of stuff. So in in the valves and the panels. And the locations and the operating procedures are what it is on his ship. It's not just some general, this is a ship. It, it, when, so when he walks onto his ship after doing this sort of training in A school or C school, he's not going to be wondering where stuff is on the ship. This valve, talk about, I wonder where that is. He already knows where it is because we've made him do it 20 times. And you can do a lot of damage in a simulator without hurting anybody or yourself. And you can make a lot of mistakes. You don't want to flood a space on a ship just to learn proper valve lineup. Okay, so anyway, that, that's what we're talking. In the simulation strategy, when you get into tactical training, um, we need to have a place ashore and afloat that gives us realistic rep threat representations. And a couple of areas: um, surface sonar techs. Um, we're investing in both the onboard trainer that's going on some later versions of the Alpha of the SQQ89 is going to be way more robust than it is and provide pretty realistic training for our surface sonar techs. And we're also going to do a, a similar uh, ashore trainer in the fleet concentration areas, and it's going to be an integrated air and missile defense and anti submarine warfare trainer that will mimic DG-51, which is the dominant number of surface combatants with those two capabilities. So that, that's what we're doing, and, and why are we doing that? Well, it gives us, uh, you know, it's all, it's all integrated, it's all related, okay? So when the ship's getting modernized, ship's sitting in the yards, you know, I'll use any of, AC, any of the ACB-12, uh, which is the baseline 9, it's about a year long to get that done, and so the, the crew doesn't have a combat system available to them for way over a year. So they get really rusty, and it takes a long time to get them out, and it eats into the combat capability of the fleet because it takes a year to modernize them, and it takes another six or eight months to just get up to speed to get back into the training cycle. So w with high-fidelity simulators, you can do those sets and reps that you need to do in both combat or down in the engine room to improve yourself so when you do get on the ship, you're ready to go, and you're not doing really, really basic stuff you know, burning 50,000 gallons of gas a day at whatever the price of gas is to do that. So that, that's one of the, that's the simulation strategy. It, it's comprehensive. It talks about tactical simulation and uh, virtual reality training. Um, offensive lethality, there's, we're, we're, I, I have been, this has been an issue for me for my entire career. Um, we need to improve the offensive lethality of the surface force. Um, and, and there's a number of ways to do that. Um, in, in the future, in the, the far future, like 2020s time frame, we're talking a pretty big emphasis on energy-based weapons. Um, lasers for defense and, and offense, um, rail guns, high-speed microwaves, and we've got to invest more in soft kill uh, also so we can free up more space in the missile launchers for offensive weapons instead of filling them up with six or ten million dollar defensive weapon systems. So that, that, that's, a big, that's a big issue for me. It's a big issue for Tom Luton sitting back there because he's got to pay for it. Um, the sustainable excellence, um, the middle pillar there. Um, modernization through modularity. Um, 
there's ways to build ships so that you don't have to cut them in half and stretch them and improve the combat and take them offline for a year and a half or two to improve at their halfway point in their life, their combat capability. If you do things smart, if you do things right, um, you can build it so you have these long-lasting universal interfaces so when you develop a new software or a new piece here, um, you have built the ship so it's got a hole inside the ship to take the old stuff out and put the new stuff in or in the front of the ship to put the old, pull the launcher out, put the new launcher in. Those are the types of things that the, the flexible, flexible modular design effort that N96 is doing and N95 is also thinking about it too for the next class of amphibious ships. And Dave Lewis is kind of leading the charge over there as PEO ship. So some, some good work going through there. And I think, and again, it's a, will it help anybody here in the fleet? It won't help anybody in the fleet in probably the next five or ten years. But when our kids are standing up here as, as you know, I don't know if my kid's not going to be Navy, but anyway, <laughs> maybe one of your kids will be standing up here someday. <laughs> and, they'll be, and they'll be able to, to talk differently about how modernization occurs and how quickly we can do it and how we do it's the same or more with a lot less people on the ships than we do right now. But you've got to do the technology before you pull the people off. That's what you've got to do. Um, Condition-based maintenance, I already talked about it, so I won't go a whole lot more into it, but I think it's, some, I think it's an investment that we've got to make uh, on the legacy fleet too, because if you can control the time and place in which you do maintenance on stuff, because you got a better idea of the condition instead of doing it when it flies apart and you do a C3 cash rep on deployment or in the middle of an engagement, I think you can get your A sub O up for the warfighter without spending a whole lot more money, because there's not a whole lot more money to be spent. So we we've got to I, I think we've got to do some investments in condition-based maintenance for the rest of the Navy to help us out. Commonality, you heard me talk about variance reduction and commonality. Uh, Admiral Gordy was kind enough to sign a letter to all system commanders uh, to entreat them to think about it in their current modernization plans, how to reduce the amount of variation that we have by either contracting the amount of time it takes to do a modernization. If you, I'll use the TACAN as I use that as an example, and it's not against TACAN, but we have a program that replaces 10 TACANs a year. And we do. We have to. Re we have made spare parts for the, the legacy tack in for a long time, and a school, you know, so all that kind of stuff. So it's going to take us till like 2026 or something like that to replace all the tack in on a 10. I mean, so do it all in six months, you know. Get every ship and fleet done. Quit, you know, we're looking at that. I don't know if it's possible, but th that's the sort of stuff that when you develop a modernization plan, you got to think about because there's quite a big cost to having two logistics trains and two schoolhouses and two NECs and track. All this kind of stuff adds up to. Uh, wasted effort and detracts from our ability to put war fighting first. So that, that's when I talk about commonality and variance reduction, that's one of the things that we're talking about. And then future ship designs, can we come up with, you know, if, if we need a, a drivetrain, then we come up with a drivetrain. If you need a bigger ship to go faster, you just add another drivetrain or a third drivetrain or a general, whatever the, whatever the smart guys that, you know, the, in the AP community and the ED community come up with. But those are the sorts of things we have to do because there's not going to be a lessening of the demand for the surface Navy over the next 50 years, in, in my opinion. Um, as a matter of fact, I think the demand will remain what it is, and we're, we're pretty hard-pressed right now to meet the demand signal out there. Um, the operation, the uh, optimal uh, OFRP, which Admiral Gortney is going to talk about tomorrow, is going to try and help us do a little bit better job in that and making us more of a supply-based model than a demand-based model than we are right now. Um, so I'm not going to steal any of his thunder because he's going to talk about it for about 45 minutes. But that's another effort that is underway to kind of get us to this war fighting ability and sustainable excellence. It's, it's making sure we, we do the availabilities at the same time and we get our training time that we need and we deploy when the, the day we said we were going to deploy and we come back the day we were going to come back. So there's some, so there's some uh, levelness in people's lives. Um, wholeness over time, the last column there. Um, surface master plan this last fall, um, there's been a lot of work going on by a number of people for about three years, and we finally got the surface. They're on the zipper net, so I, I can't give you the website because they're classified. But um, what the surface master plan is, it looks across sort of like the readiness kill chains on how long is a ship going to last, what do we got to do to get it to last that long, what modernizations do we got to do and when in the employment cycle do we have to do that modernization to get it to expected service life, and, what, and when the replacement ship comes on, when do we got to get that thing going? Because we don't want to have a three or four year capacity gap like we do right now in a particular class of amphibious ships. Um, we don't want to do that because it's making this, it's making the ones out there work way too hard to meet the present. So um, we're, we're going to do that. Um, the readiness kill chain stuff. I, I like it so much that we're going to ex we've expanded it to the surface to shore connectors. I think it's a great way to think about things because it, again, it gets into the why are you there? It's not just this readiness snapshot in time. 
It tells you why you're at that radio snap. It makes you take a deep look, and it makes you connect everything together. Because you can't, there's, there's no one, you can't just throw a bunch of money in the P pillar and say, we're done, fixed. Just wait 10 years. There's, it's not that way. They're all very, very interconnected. Um, and one thing leads to another in each of the pillars. And, and so we organize the surface warfare enterprise to take advantage of that by making, you know, all the, P, the P pillar and the E pillar and the S pillar, and they all do their work. And then when they're all done, they go through, for current readiness, they go through him. And for future readiness, they go through him and him, N96 and N95, and Admiral Gumatata, for those of you who couldn't see him sitting here, um, is the current readiness. And so they integrate the work of all these pillars to make sure that we're putting the investments in a balanced way to both support current readiness and to make sure that we know what the resource, we, we have a pretty good idea what the resources are going to be 10 years from now. Are we doing the right things now to set us up 10 years from now or 15 years from now? Uh, and finally, I, I talked about, I won't discuss any more, development of our senior leadership. That's both officer enlisted. We've got to invest more in that to make sure, particularly in the enlisted force. We've got, if we want the chief to be the tech rep, we've got to give him the shore duty jobs that improve across his career, that improve his ability to become the tech rep. He's got to work on this stuff when he's ashore because some, you know, anybody has been to sea, you don't have all day long to just sit around reading tech manuals and doing what-if drills on how to troubleshoot stuff. There's a lot of we work. Our crews very, very hard, particularly in the maintenance and based in the unit level training. It's very, very hard work. And it is. It's hard to get a ship. You have to work hard to be good and to take a ship that has to be ready on the flip of a GQ switch to go to war. It's not, there's nothing else like it in the military than being on a naval ship at sea on deployment. You have to be ready to go to combat on zero notice. And it takes very, very hard work to do that. Um, we got to make on the, that's on the one hand, but on the other hand, we got to make sure we're not doing stuff that is not of value to producing war fighting. So we're doing a lot, there's a lot of efforts that not on the slide and reduction of administrative attraction. Are we doing too many assessments? Um, is, is the PMS system about right? Do we need to fix it? Yes, and, and, and all those sorts of things. So because um, at the end of the day, the quality of service and and, that, and that's a combination of do you have the right spare parts? You know, is is your pier, can you walk down your pier without falling through a hole in it? Uh, do you have parking place? Do you have the IT bandwidth that you need to do your job? And all this, it's all this kind of stuff. You know, and did you join the Navy to do this job, and is that what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Or we got you doing that for just a few weeks out of the year, and the rest of the time you're doing something that you didn't imagine you'd be doing. Those are the sorts of things that we have to go after in the long term and make sure we got it right. So but with that, I'm, I'm done talking. Be happy to take any questions questions or comments or anything along those lines. That's good. <laughs> Hang on. One guy. He beat you too. He's just he's walking up to the mic. Uh, good afternoon, Admiral Lieutenant Wilcox. I'm first lieutenant. Yours is Fort McHenry down Little Creek. Okay. Uh, I don't think there's a school in here, hopefully, that hasn't said, man, I, I don't want any more offensive weapons. I like the ones I have, and, and I don't want any more. And I see that uh, you've got that up there as one of your points. Being that it takes so long to develop new weapon systems, uh, especially for a new platform, can we expect to see any more sort of a, a rapid bolt-on like the Mark 38 Mod Deuces? Any more capability in the immediate future, uh, especially with regard to maybe not so much lat uh, littoral, but open ocean? I, I think what's your definition of immediate? What's the time frame? <laughs> uh, so in the next four or five years? There'll be, if that's your, yes, there's going to be, we're going to improve the capability of, of existing weapon systems um, and new capabilities that we're feeling right now that we're not here to form seen as a capability for certain missiles. And, they're going, you know, and, and so, um, yes, we are doing that. Um, there, there's quite a, there's a lot of interest in this. I'm not the only person interested in this. The CNO is very interested in it. Um, and there's, there's ways to rapidly field, and when I use the term rapid, it's not like, you know, we walk out the room and I walk up to some guy, hey, let's get that missile on the ship and it's there the next day. That doesn't happen. I'm talking, you know, less than the 10 year cycle from, you know, having an idea and competing it and RFPs and all kinds of stuff because our, you know, we have allies out there that spend lots of dough on, and there's pretty capable surface to surface weapon systems out there. Um, and, and we look at those. Um, and, and, and there's other services that have weapons out there that maybe, uh, easily modified for our own use that will increase the lethality of our ship. So, um, yeah, we're, I think you'll see some changes in the 
in the next four or five years. Would you agree with that, Tom? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Sir, Lieutenant Commander Chris Wolf from Surfland. Uh, on the topic of the Naval Surface and Expeditionary Warfare Command, uh, do you, how do you intend on leveraging our current uh, Surface Tactical Development Group uh, based there in Little Creek in order to fold them into that, or is that part of the process that's developing this community? They'll be That'll be part of the remaking of, of that capability. We, we've got to make it more robust than it has been in the past. Sir. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of – and there's going to be a lot of cooperation. Um, in Souk, I mean, some people say, hey, describe it like Top Gun. Well, Top Gun is, is the method by which you produce a really good air-to-air -air combat aviator, and then there's Strike U that produces a really good aviator that can drop bombs and stuff like that. Um, and it's sort of that concept. It's to start, you know, developing, you know, picking out really hot running officers at the 02, 03 level and start developing them. But, you know, we're talking, you know, the NSUC is going to be all of the, you know, depending on what class of ship, you know, anywhere from 11 to 14 different warfare areas. Because sometimes you're doing them all at the exact same time. And we have to make sure that we provide the background and the training and the equipment to make sure that you're able to do to, to, to use these very expensive warships to the best of our ability. So it, it's going to include that. Um, th there's The COAs on how we stand it up are still up in the air, and it would be pre premature for me to discuss them here. That's it. Admiral Morgan Ames, uh, first off, I applaud you on the, the, the spectrum that you're covering here uh, with the warfighting ability and uh, stand-up of NSUC. Um, so that each of our JOs gets, uh, you know, versed in Ender's Game and uh, be able to attack that Kobayashi Maru problem as they're faced with it uh, during their careers. And also that, that aspect, there's, you know, we've got some politics at play in here. We've got uh, the uh, sustainability issues with sparing, which you've touched on, uh, and uh, nav sups, uh, inventory control points, making sure we've got the right sparing and integrated logistic support. And I'm just wondering if you could talk on that, that tail aspect a little bit more, uh, how you're working with N4 or so on that, uh, yeah. because sparing is a big problem across all the DOD right now. Yeah. Um, N4, the chief of supply, uh, global logistics supply, they're all in the surface warfare enterprise. Um, and they're in that supply pillar, and that's what they do on a daily basis. And, and we've made some great progress. I'll tell you, the global logistics force guys, when we started doing the RKC stuff, discovered that, you know, we had parts um, that we needed, but they weren't in the right place to quickly get. So we've moved a lot of parts around the world here in the last year or so, the supply guys have. Um, and we underfunded a, a couple of parts accounts uh, for a couple of years, and, and it takes a while to catch up because uh, you, sometimes you lose industrial base if you only got one person making that thing, and you and you take a one-year holiday, the people can't stay in business just on the hope that we'll start making that part again. So, um, yeah, I mean, we we look at it. I mean, this it's one of the pillars. It's one of the things we do every day is to figure out: do we have the right parts? Do we have enough money to buy the right parts, and are they in the right place at the right time? So, yeah, and, and we work with across all of the various stakeholders. That are responsible for that. Thank you. And one follow-up uh, on LCS. Uh, it's the littoral combat ship. Are we really pushing to make her an open ocean uh, warfighting uh, platform? And do, does she have the right bandwidth to support those capabilities? Because uh, as I recall, we were we were studying all sorts of issues with uh, the metacentric height. If you if you installed SHF antennas, et cetera, will they have that bandwidth capability to really be able to perform open ocean? The, the ships are designed to fill warfare capability gaps in the littorals, to conform surf SUW in the littorals, to conduct mine countermeasures in the littorals, and they can do open ocean mine warfare and anti-submarine warfare. There's nothing that will prevent them from doing anti-submarine warfare both in the littorals or out in the open ocean. Um, and, you know, and, and certainly because of the design of the ship where we're able to uh, upgrade them uh, relatively rapidly once we get the, the mission package or the, the mission module that might go with the mission package upgraded um, because of the way we've designed it from the keel up, the interfaces, you, you plug it in and, you know, hook the track and hit the button and whatever you got installed in the box, whether it's a missile, ray gun, whatever, hits what you want it to hit. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they could do that, and bandwidth is relatively easy. I mean, we make rapid 
leaps in technology on weight and space and bandwidth on a yearly basis. So I, I don't worry about that one too much. I think over here next. School boss, uh, thanks for the update on freedom and your assessment of our deployment. And I uh, wonder if you could comment on where our independence stands, uh, how she's coming along, what are yeah. her immediate future plans uh, that you can talk to sure. about the um, confidentiality and, you know, where we – how you feel about her material-wise, that sort of thing. She's, she's coming out of a post-shakedown shake, post shake availability in San Diego right now, and then she's going to, later on in the spring, she's going to transit around the Gulf of Mexico on, you know, she's going to be gone for a long time, not, not call her deployment because she's in home waters, and she'll be doing uh, mine uh, countermeasure mission package, operate, developmental testing and operational testing for, Brian, about the next year, right? Yeah. In, into 15, yeah. So that... She she's been she's she's been you know now she hasn't been on a ten month deployment so hadn't got the 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 shakedown uh, that the freedom has but it's it's been you know it's LM twenty five hundreds we got them on all, you know a bunch of ships uh, MTU diesels are behaving very nicely the the hull mechanical uh, is is going well and you know the combat systems you know we haven't shaken it out yet so we got we probably have some work to go there so I, we're, I'm pretty satisfied with how it's going and when we get done with the uh, testing and we start uh, the Coronados coming around here. We commission them in uh, I think first first week in April. Uh, we'll start building the numbers up and then we'll be able to send more because we want them to go out in groups of three. That's twos and threes and fours and operate together. That was the operational design. So I'm going to take one last question because I know the second half starts in four and a half minutes. So I'm Robbie Harris, a former destroyer man. Okay. Uh, thank you for being with us today and thank you for being so candid. You began by acknowledging that uh, there are readiness deficits in the surface Navy, but I lost track. Could you could you uh, just put a fine point for us for us on that? What are the top three readiness deficits in your view? It'd be long. The 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 top readiness deficit is the correct number of people with the correct skill sets and experiences on the ships. That's my top readiness degrader right now. Um, and it manifests itself in a bunch of different ways. We do a lot of cross decks on in the service community. Um, and we do them as ships get ready to go out the door on certain skill sets that we don't have enough of. And there's lots of different reasons for why. And it's the school length and bonus structure and, you know, what's the civilian job market, all, all that stuff. What does that bring to bear? So that, that's, that's the number one thing. And that's why it's my number one priority in the long term to fix that. Um, because if you got the right number of people and they really know what they're doing on how to operate and fix their gear, you, you can do anything. Um, they're, they're ingenious. I mean, I've been in awe and amazed by the ability of our sailors throughout my entire career to to really take nothing and make it into something. And uh, but we got you know my responsibility is to make sure we give them the tools that they can do that. Um, number and then, two, number three, number two. Um, Number two is, probably, is the amount of uh, money we have for modernization and maintenance. Um, we have a pretty big uh, holiday uh, deficit position from the 2003 to 2008 time frame in which we have to uh, invest heavily to, I, I don't, some people use the term reset, um, but it's to do the maintenance that we, that we skipped that we didn't do. And, you know, when you skip it for four or five years, it gets way expensive. To, to do it. It's not the same. So when you make a decision in an execution year to not do something and decide to do it four years later, then the resource sponsor's got to pitch in about three times as much money to do the same thing as you get. So, um, and I, I, you know, those are very complex. And I think the, uh, my, I think the number three would be um, commonality and getting to less different kinds of systems because it helps out the first two. Sir, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. I know the second half is coming on.